There's a swing in my voice and a stone in my praise. Pushing back when the darkest weapons form. And there's a power on my lips, even death can't defy. When the name of our God is lifted high, cause there is resurrection power. When we sing the name of Jesus, resurrection power. When we raise a mighty sun, so come and let the praise get loud. Make that into grave, raise now, cause there is resurrection power. And there are days I have seen filled with heartache and loss that have buried my heart beneath the wave. But every time this place breaks out, death things rise up from the ground. I won't leave my song inside that. Come on, church, let's stand up and worship.
Let's Woo. try this together. He is risen. He is risen indeed. One more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Oh, well, welcome, family, to West Salem Foursquare. We are so glad you're here. Uh, Easter is an incredible time that we get to celebrate as the body of Christ, and we are just so thrilled to be here yeah. with all of you. So thanks for coming. If this is your first time here, we want to say welcome, a big old welcome. Can we just Hello. give a hand to the first time believer? Yes. Yep. First time Thank comers. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. And um, we're so excited for what's going to happen and what's in store for the rest of the service. You know, uh, as people are still coming in, if you've got a seat near you that's open, it's wonderful if you're able to move in. And then the greeters will come and just find room there. and They'll be able to see where the open spots are. So that would help us. And there's always the front. I don't know why people don't come up to the front. Front row, I, wide open. I, I know I spit a lot, but... Uh, I don't know what's wrong with this, but no, we're really grateful you're here. Thanks so much. This is a great day. It's a great day to, uh, to have the cold brew flowing. It's a great day to have donut holes in the house. Nothing says resurrection like donut holes. How many know that, right? 1,800, 1800. donut holes. Not just for this service. You have to spread them out. So we got to save some for next service. But listen, we got a lot. We got a lot for you. So grateful you're here. We're going to worship the Lord. We're going to sing some songs. You may know them. You may not. The, the lyrics will be on the screen. If you don't know them, a great way to get through this today is just to say watermelon, watermelon over and over and over, just so you're moving your mouth. You know what I'm saying? And people will be like, wow, they love this song. This is great. We encourage you, though, just sing along with us. We encourage you to dive in with us when we get into the Bible. We're going to open the Bible in just a few moments, and, and we're going to talk out of the story of the resurrection. And we just got some great things in store for today. This is a great day to celebrate the fact that Jesus is no longer in the tomb, uh, there's a song we're going to sing in just a moment. It, it just affirms the fact that there is no body in the grave now. There's no one in there. It's empty, and that's what we celebrate today. But honestly, we're resurrection people, so we celebrate Easter every day. But on this particular Easter morning, we do it in grand form. I bring out the drums. If you are here last year, I won't carry one around anymore. My back can't handle that anymore. <laughs> So that's done. But uh, no, anyway, we're just going to celebrate. We're going to have a great time. So I want you to pray with us. Pray, and let's just welcome the presence of the Lord into this house, and then we're going to begin to worship. Lord God, thank you for your resurrection. Thank you first for just sending Jesus and for living a, a sinless life and, and dying a cruel death on the cross. And then three days later, rising from the dead. Lord, we celebrate that with, with such purpose today. Because we know that the same power that raised Christ from the dead can raise us to eternal life. And so we want to just give you our honor, give you our praise today in this house. And we thank you for the moments that we have together on this Easter morning. Receive our worship, receive our praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen? amen? Let's worship together.
enemy can hold you down Cause there's nobody in the grave now One head gets to wear that crown Cause there's nobody in the grave now No enemy can hold you down Cause there's nobody in the grave now One head gets to wear that crown darkest day in history there on a cross they made for sinners for every curse his blood atoned and one final breath and it was finished but now
This is the declaration of our heart. It's the word of our mouth. It's the things we hold true and know to believe. For the majority of this is of us in this room, we've gathered in this space because we have come to find that you are an alive God, not a dead God. And we worship that which is alive. We lift our songs, we lift our hands, we lift our our praise and our adoration to an alive God. Receive our worship, receive our praise as such. You deserve it, Lord. You deserve our highest praise. All of this we pray, all this we believe, all this we declare in the name of Jesus Christ. Everyone said, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Before you grab a seat, I'm just looking around here. Before you grab a seat, if you've got a spot in the middle of you, when everyone sits down, move in and let's see if we can't get some of these folks off the side. Hi over there. You're like, this is the, what is it? What do we want to call you over here? I don't know. This is the, the dog pound? How many remember Arsenio Hall? Remember the dog pound? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay, I don't know. That's, that really dated me today. So listen, before you grab a seat, if there's a spot in there, just move in if you would. And give out like five high fives to people as you grab a seat. Why don't you do that, all right? High fives all the way around. Welcome, happy Resurrection Day to everyone. My name is John. If you're wondering who I am, I'm John, the lead pastor here. I'm one of the pastoral staff. My wife and I have the great honor and privilege of serving this congregation. Very, very grateful uh, to be with you today. It's my privilege uh, to share from the Bible today. I want to open the Bible and uh, just want to get into the scripture in just a few moments. Um, but first, I just got to clear something up. Uh, from the back to the front, um, I have had too many people asking this question, and I gotta just I gotta settle it right now. These are not carrots on my shirts, okay? <laughs> These are flowers, people. So I mean, raise your hand if you thought it was a carrot. Let's just find out who you are. Okay. <laughs> they're they're flowers. Come on now. But carrots seem to kind of work, you know? I mean, it, it sort of just fits. So I would have been fine if it was carrots. So anyway. So they're flowers. And uh, this is Easter morning, and I'm grateful to open the Bible. I love talking about Jesus. I love particularly talking about uh, Jesus' death, Jesus' uh, resurrection, Jesus' eventual return. I love that. I love that message. It's a message that, in my opinion, it's as powerful and it's as personal as it was 2,000 years ago. The, here's the deal. It never gets old. 
To me, it never gets old. Do you ever find it interesting that if you come on Easter, primarily if that's the weekend that you would attend, um, that you hear this message over and over and over? But I gotta tell you, people have been preaching this message for 2,000 plus years, and it never wears out. It's always powerful, and it's always personal. It always has a message for each one of us, and so that's my prayer today, is that you would get something out of what we're gonna get into today from the scripture, from the message and life of Jesus. Let me, let me tell you a quick story. It's, it's both a, a sad and a funny story to me. I remember hearing this years ago about an Easter service in Bangladesh and where they'd gathered a number of kids together and they got them all together in the church building or a Grange Hall, wherever it was that they were meeting, and they put all these kids in there together and they presented the Jesus film. And the Jesus film is this widely produced, widely distributed film that comes in almost every language and dialect uh, on the face of the earth. And it's the whole life and message of Jesus and it's presented and then they give a response and an altar call and people can receive Christ. And they were showing this to a group of kids and it got to the point in the story, if you're familiar at all with the Bible and the life of Jesus, it got to the point when he was crucified. So he was being nailed to a cross you know, large spikes going into his wrists and into his ankles, and then they took a sword and they put it into his side, if you're familiar with that story, true story, by the way. And they're portraying this all on film, and the kids are losing it. I mean, they're just weeping, they're gasping. Every, every little hammer hit was like, <gasps> they would all just start to kind of get all worked up. And it got to where it was actually very, very kind of scary and almost traumatizing for this group of kids in this room as they were just seeing this message coming at them so fast and furious until one boy, and this is where I giggle, this one boy, he's like, I gotta, I gotta deal with this. And he stands up right in the middle of this entire group of boys and kids that were watching this film, and he stands up and he goes, hey, don't be scared. He gets up again. I've seen this one before. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the message. That's the message. And how many know we're grateful for a kid like that that gives that spoiler alert, right? But how many of you in this room with a quick show of hands you can't stand people that give you spoiler alerts like in movies or something like that. They're sitting behind you, and they've, they've seen the movie before. They're like, oh, yeah, this is like my 14th time watching Dune 2, you know, that kind of thing. And I'm just going to tell you everything about it. And you're like, shut up. How many of you know there's a special place in my heart for those people? You know what I'm saying? So talk about a spoiler alert. I'm going to be that guy today. I'm gonna be that guy that gives a spoiler alert today. Here it is. Jesus rose from the dead. That's what he did. Jesus rose from the dead, spoiler alert, okay? And I get that out of the scripture. I got that message. It's all throughout the scripture, but I found this one particular verse that just seems to encapsulate the whole thing. It's in the book of Acts, and it's in chapter two, and it's verse 32, and this verse is, I think, so powerful. It's what we're going to spend our time on today. It says, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Now, the one speaking, the one giving this spoiler alert, if you will, is a guy named Peter. Peter's one of the disciples of Jesus, and uh, here in Acts chapter 2, we read of this time in which Peter, after the day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that Peter stands up in front of a huge crowd of people, thousands of people, and he gives this, ma this massive message, and it's in front of a huge crowd. I mean, thousands, like, okay, so like last service was a full room. This service is even, even more of a full room. So, and next service, we don't know what that'll look like, but there'll be thousands of people coming through this building today. And, and they're going to hear a message, and this message is the one that Peter brought to a huge crowd. He preached for about 20 minutes. By the way, just spoiler alert, I'll preach for about 20 minutes today. Okay, so if you got like a roast in the oven or ham or something like that. Okay. And after he preached, it says that 3,000 were added to their number on that day. Now, what does added to their number mean? So added to the number means these were individuals that were previously not following Jesus, but now because of what they heard, they, they were, scripture says they were cut to the heart. 
like cut to the heart. That's conviction. Like something happened where they're like, oh, that's me. That's me we're talking about. As Peter was preaching, they're like, yep, you're reading my mail, brother. And they responded, and it says 3, 000, about 3,000 were added to their number on that day. That means a lot of people were cut to the heart, repented, and responded to the saving work of Jesus. There's gonna be an opportunity for you to do that today in just a handful of moments. In that crowd, I could imagine, I wasn't there, but I could imagine that there were all kinds of people. As a matter of fact, the scripture tells us that there were all kinds of people. It refers to 120 people that were disciples of Jesus. These were diehard followers of Jesus. It also refers to, in verse 12, how some of them were amazed and they were perplexed about all that was going on. Now, we all know that there's those kind of people too, right? They're ones that kind of stand back, like leaning up against the wall like a junior high dance, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and they're just like, what's going on here? And what happened? You know? And this kind of sense of like, I'm confused, but it's intriguing. It's, how many know it's almost like a, a, a wreck of sorts? You don't want to look, but you can't not look. You know, you're like, oh, I want to see what's going on there. Amazed, perplexed. The scripture tells us all kinds of people of, of various backgrounds, languages, dialects, all coming together and gathering. In verse 13 of Acts chapter 2, it tells us a whole bunch of folks were mocking. So you had that group too. You had a group of people standing off to the side and just teasing and just making statements about the rest of the people that were following Jesus and having this encounter with the Spirit of God. So you get that in a group, right? So all these folks coming together, and I could imagine, again, now the text doesn't say this, but I can just picture, because when you get a lot of people together in one space, I'll bet you there were a number of them that were there because someone just drug them there, right? Like, mom wants you to go to church today kind of thing. And I don't need a show of hands, but I'll bet you there's a, a couple dozen that might be here today because your mom or your, dad or your spouse said, we're going to church today, it's Easter, we're doing this. I even hear of people, young kids, that are like, we want to go to church. We, we, we have families here because kids want to come and gather. And the parents are like, okay, at least they're not doing drugs, you know. <laughs> Let's go to church, you know. So you may just feel like you've been drug here. You drug here? Oh no. <laughs> you may feel like someone tricked you into coming, but to all of you, regardless of who you are, seeker, um, skeptic, cynic, if you're here to, to mock or if you're here to uh, to kind of stand back, what the scripture says, amazed and perplexed, unsure what's really going on. Why are there people with hands lifted? Why are they singing out loud? Why are they clapping? I mean, all these things that don't make sense to you. To each one of you today, I wanted to say what Peter said. Peter said this in Acts 2, 32. God has raised this Jesus to life. And we are all, I love that word all. We are all witnesses of it. We're all witnesses of it. You gotta know that when he said that, he wasn't just talking to the actual people that saw firsthand the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. He was talking about people that had heard a message, that had heard the gospel of Jesus being born as, as an infant and living a sinless life and dying a cruel death and, and the message of this resurrection that would come days later. That's what being a witness of it, you have to see it firsthand. Now here's the deal though. For someone to be raised to life, this is gonna be kind of one of those no-brainer moments here, but for someone to be raised to life, someone first has to be dead, right? You first have to be dead in order to be raised to life, and, and that's what Peter's gonna get into in this sermon that he gives. He's gonna get into that in verse 23. You can see it on the screen and follow along. He says, this man, Jesus, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you put him to death by nailing him to the cross. You put him to death. Now, I love the way that this speaks. It's like, there was a deliberate plan of God. He didn't like come up with it at the last minute. God didn't turn his back, and all of a sudden when he turned and looked, and went, whoa, Jesus has been crucified, what happened? No, there's a deliberate plan that God put into place really since the foundation of the earth, since the fall of humanity in the time of Adam and Eve. 
that there was a plan put into motion to redeem us, to save us. And, but with the help of wicked men, we nailed, we are, we're part of that, that culture and that, that group that would have nailed him to the cross. And then he goes on and he says in verse 24, he says, but God, that's my favorite phrase in all of scripture, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. In other words, you can't keep a good man down, right? Jesus, you just can't keep Jesus down. He's gonna rise. God in heaven saw to it that the power of the Lord came and rose him from the dead. And we see this life of Jesus being played out, but now Peter is gonna illustrate something because remember I told you, you can't raise something from the dead unless it's actually been dead first. And, and, and the fact of the matter is Jesus is no longer dead, he's now alive, and Peter's gonna illustrate it with another kind of iconic figure from the scripture. He's gonna illustrate it with David. You may be familiar with the, with the name David. David is a, a larger than life figure in the Old Testament. Uh, king. He was first a shepherd out in the field and then became king of, of Israel. We know the stories of David and Goliath, you know, David and Bathsheba, you know, all these iconic stories of David. But he's going to illustrate this and he's going to say, I want, I want to show you the life of David, but I want to give it to you in a twist. Okay, check this out. Verse 29. Peter says, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried. Now he doesn't end there. Because then it says, and his tomb is here to this day. His tomb is here to this day. Now, what's this have to do with anything? What he's trying to prove and what he's trying to show is that even though David was an Old Testament prophet, Old Testament king, even though he was a really good guy, except for some you know, significant mess-ups, he's a pretty good guy. But he wasn't the Messiah. He was not the Messiah. He was not the one that was gonna come and save people from their sins. He was just a man. And he's telling, a, he's saying, hey, listen, David, good guy, he died. He died and he's in a tomb. He's still there in that tomb. I mean, decomposed somewhat, right, by now. And by the way, I've been to Israel a dozen times and I have gone to what many believe, not all, but many believe is the actual tomb of David. So we've gone there and there's people always seated around and they're reading the scriptures and they're coming and they're singing songs and, and there's, there, these are, this was a significant individual but he's still in the tomb. And so are a number of key leaders. As a matter of fact, let me just point out to you uh, three out of five of the world's major religions. Let's talk about them for a second. Okay, let's talk about Islam for a second. So Islam was founded by Muhammad. Okay, Muhammad, you, don't, you may not know this, but maybe you remember back to like your high school uh, course on this, and, and I'll just re remind you, he died. He's dead. He died in 632 AD. He was 60 years old. His tomb and his remains are still there. They're visited by thousands of people annually. He's dead, though. Uh, Judaism, that's another one of our major world religions. Judaism, many would say, is, is, it really seeks to kind of establish Abraham as, you know, the father. If you remember Sunday school, father, Abraham, <laughs> had many sons, right? You put your right arm in, you put your left arm. Okay, um, that's a different song. Okay, never mind. Um, that's something different. <laughs> you do the hokey pokey and turn yourself around. Okay, that's not right. Um, Abraham, though. Abraham is dead. He's dead. We read of it in Genesis chapter 25. He died around 1900 BC, the scripture says, at a ripe old age. He's dead. Um, we can look to, to Buddhism. Buddhism that would be founded around uh, uh, the Buddha, obviously. The most ancient, reliable piece of literature regarding Buddhism says this, quote, when Buddha died, it was with that utter passing away in which nothing whatsoever remains behind. Let me interpret that for you. He's dead. <laughs> He's dead. 
Friends, don't miss what I'm about ready to tell you right now. Only Christianity claims its founder is alive. That's it. Only Christianity claims its founder is alive. God, Scripture says, has raised this Jesus to life. That's what he did. There is irrefutable proof to his resurrection. You can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that event happened. It literally happened. We can be absolutely certain. There's a lot of things in life that we can't be certain of, but we can be certain of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me give you just a handful of proofs, okay? And when you put them all together, they start, I mean, they make something. When you, when you start looking at them individually, you may go, well, that's no big deal, but I'm just gonna give you three or four. There are 15, 20 different proofs of the resurrection that we could go through line by line and just help you understand that the resurrection was a legitimate event. Let's just start with the fact that there was a two-ton stone in front of the grave. I don't know which good-looking, beefy men in this room want to move that, but I'm telling you, that two-ton stone doesn't just move by, 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 by human effort, okay? It was intended to be there and not to be moved because it's so big. And you may say, well, what about the guards? Well, the guards would have never been involved in moving that stone because they would have lost their lives. But when you come to the story and you see the disciples coming to that tomb, you see a, tomb, you see a stone that was moved away and nowhere Anywhere near there are the what we believe to be 16 to 20 soldiers that were on paid duty to be there guarding that place. They were gone. They were gone. What was left? What was found? What they found were some grave clothes, and those grave clothes were in the tomb. And you may think, well, that's no big deal. Well, it is a big deal. Let me tell you why. Because those grave clothes, according to tradition of that day, the way that they would process a dead body is they would wrap them in cloth and they would pack it. It would be just absolutely packed with very expensive spices. The kinds of spices that you're not just going to leave behind. The kind of spices that would have cost a ton and they could have resold. The kind of spices that would have costed way more than a lot of us have just throw around at a funeral like that. Imagine those grave clothes laying there, never being taken. No body is inside of those grave clothes. They're just laying there. That would be similar to if someone were to come along and see a wallet, and they pick up that wallet, and in that wallet were multiple $100 bills. And they're like, oh my, what an amazing wallet, and leave the money and take the wallet. Why would you take a dead body and not take that which cost so much. If someone came along to steal the body of Jesus, they could care less about the body. They want what is costly, and they would have never left it. Friends, we could go on and on, but if that wasn't enough, probably the most powerful of all proofs that we have of the resurrection of Jesus Christ were all of the multitude of people that actually witnessed it. The people that saw him alive, the people that had seen him crucified and dying in a way that no one could survive. And now he is revealing himself. He's walking around, not only walking around, but we know according to the scriptural text, he's actually walking into rooms without even opening doors. Boo, that's awesome. Just going right through. And he's revealing himself to a bunch of people. Mary was one of them. The disciples were another 10, uh, 10 to 12 uh, uh, individuals. A guy named Cleopas is mentioned in scripture along with his friend. You got uh, Matthi uh, Matthias who replaced Judas to become the new disciple. We read of Jesus revealing himself to his half-brother, James. We read also in 1 Corinthians 15, it says that there were over 500. Everyone say 500. 500, 500 individuals that Jesus appeared to and they saw him in the resurrected state. This was not just one person's testimony. We have 500 plus individuals that have said, we know he's risen from the dead. And, and there could be individuals in this room that you'd say, well, I mean, that speaks of those that were around at that time. 
They got to see Jesus historically. But what's this have to do with me? I'm telling you what it has to do with you. Here it is. History is his story. And his story can be your story. His story can be your story. When the Bible says that God raised Jesus from the dead and we are all witnesses of it, friends, that's us. When you encounter Jesus as Lord and Savior, when you submit your heart to the Lord, when you put your trust in him, the same power that raised Christ from the dead will raise us spiritually. It raises us to eternal life. And not just eternal life, but to life right now. We have life right now. Our story intersects with his story. And it can become your story, friends. If you're a Christian today, everything that I've just said is really cause for celebration. Like, honestly, it's like, hello, that's good. That's good news right? It's the reason you can get up in the morning. It's the reason you can put your head down at night in peace. It's the reason that you want to speak to other people about what has happened in your life. So if you're a follower of Jesus, woo, game on. This is good news. If you are yet to become a follower of Jesus, it's it's cause for decision. It's cause for decision. Maybe perhaps you're a seeker or even a cynic. You might be a skeptic, and you're like, I just need some more time. Hey, don't force me into anything. I wouldn't. But it is cause for reflection. You're going to have to reflect. You're going to have to do business. You're going to have to take some time to say, if what I am hearing is true, then I have to do something about it. I can't just idly sit back anymore. We become accountable for what we've heard, and here's what we've heard. God raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Here's my question to you. Are you? Like, what's your story? Where does Jesus fit into your story? Is he an addendum? Is he off to the side? Are you the center of your story? Are you right at the middle and everything works around you? Or have you submitted your heart to the point where you're like, Lord, I can't do this on my own. I I need you in my life. We're all witnesses. You've heard something today. You've witnessed the gospel being spoken and communicated. Now what will you do with it? I want you to consider these questions. Consider these questions as we hear from two people from our church that are witnesses that Jesus is really alive in them. And when Jesus is alive in them, you're gonna hear how that just comes out in some very practical, real ways. Let's watch this together. I'm Haley, and this is my little sister, Larissa. And this is our story. In June of 2020, we were given from the doctors one year for her mom to live. And in 30 days, she was gone. Remembering back to the year of 2020, I was working full time in the healthcare field and that was during a pandemic. So there was a lot of fear and anxiety and heaviness already in the air. And then I was coming home to a one and barely three year old and trading one caregiver hat out for another. And then in the evenings I was driving and giving Uh, mom the best care that I could and the only time I had to process that was in the waiting period of, of driving from one place to the next and just being covered in worship music and just having that space of stillness and feeling like there's no one who knows what it feels like to be under this um this feeling of crushing inadequacy, like I can't be enough for everyone, I can't be what they need me to be. And then just feeling like this, this sounds wild, but just having this feeling that someone was in my passenger seat. And it wasn't until that season of complete um, terror and fear that I really learned what it meant to know Jesus or to be a believer. Uh, Up until that point, it had really been what I had learned in Bible school or um, what I had learned in churches or reading. But when I had to totally trust 
that the Lord was going to be there to meet me where I was at. Um, I didn't know what it meant to feel and to believe. It became a part of my life. And it was in the moments where he would meet me when I felt alone or afraid, uh, afraid that I might mess up on the medicine that we had to give our mom. Maybe I fell asleep on the shift that I had at 2 a.m. I just, it was a lot of fear. But when I really decided to lean into him, he just caught me where I was at every time. I remember back to a very specific workout in my garage. I was like, I can't listen to the hip hop or the rapper. I just, I don't have the capacity for that right now. I need you, Jesus. So I, I remember turning on worship music and grabbing my dumbbells and being like, holy cow, this is what it feels like to worship and lift weights at the same, like this is a game changer. So moving forward, I could not lift weights any other way. Like that was the highlight of my day. At different points in this journey, we both had uh, the same thought and it was just on a trip to a concert together, Larissa said, hey, have you, I want you to hear what the Lord's been putting on my heart. And I just in, said, the Lord has been saying the same thing for me. We did want to create a class where there were minimal obstacles. So we wanted moms to be able to put their kids down for naps or wake up in the morning before the kids woke up so that we could just gather together and move our bodies without feeling the mom guilt of leaving our kids at home. Mm -hmm. And to create a safe space and just say to the women, hey, we don't have it figured out either. Come join the journey with us. Yeah. So as we think back and we consider those 30 days that we had, waiting for our mom to go be with Jesus. Um, I just think it's so important on this Easter Sunday to reflect on the passing of Jesus and the waiting for his return. We are just so um, thankful for the fact that we can look back and see that he died for us and that there is a moment of waiting that is excruciating and lots of doubt, but there is always the promise of his return where we get to spend forever with him. Church, if you want to stand, we're going to sing this together. But even death was not the end. You conquered hell so I could live. Resurrecting then, resurrecting now. We believe we believe it. Resurrecting then, resurrecting now. I'm
Jesus to life and, and we're witnesses of it. And I ask you, are you? You've heard the story of two sisters. You've heard the story of Peter in the book of Acts. You see, every soul has a story, friends. What's yours? I want you to consider what your story has been. Consider what your story is now. Consider what it could be in Jesus just a moment, I want to lead you in a prayer of surrender. The Bible says in the book of Acts, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. In Romans, it, it explains it further. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And some of you are unsure of whether or not you're saved today. You're born again. You're not sure. And today, you can be sure. You can leave this place and go, I know that I know that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. In a moment, I'm asking you just to confess and believe in your heart, believing and confessing that Jesus is Lord, believing and confessing that God raised him from the dead. I'm gonna invite you just all across this room to pray with me. We're gonna pray out loud. We're just gonna pray with our voices. I'll pray out and you can repeat it. But it's more than just repeating a prayer. It's about believing something in your heart today. And so all across this room, let's just close our eyes. Let's pray together. Say, say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I want you to be my Savior and my Lord. I accept you into my life. I accept your death on the cross. I accept your resurrection. I accept your forgiveness. I accept your new life. You have been raised to life. And I am raised to life with you. In Jesus' name. Before we say amen, just keep your eyes closed. I just want to give an opportunity today. If you just prayed that, if you just believe that in your heart, I want to ask you to do something bold and wherever you're at today, it just be a, a point between you and I of just a point of agreement. This is part of that confessing. If today I'm going to ask you just lift a hand 
and lift it high. If you just prayed that, maybe you prayed it for the first time. Maybe you prayed it for the 10th time or the 100th time. It doesn't matter. You could be one who is a, a, a prodigal and you're coming back home to the Lord and saying, I need you, God. Regardless, you're receiving him as Lord and as Savior. And I'm just gonna ask you to lift a hand. I'm just gonna look across this room. I'm gonna start on, on my left. It's your right. And just, I'm gonna ask you just to lift a hand very high. And I wanna see where you're at. And yeah, one, two, three, yeah, four, five, six, seven, yeah, eight. Just lift them very high. This is what you're saying. Nine, 10, 11. That's good. Praise God. I haven't even left this section. I'm just moving towards a little bit more. Yeah, 12, 13. 14, 15, yes. I agree with you. Anyone else? Just catch my eye. 16, yes. Lord sees you. I'm going to move to the middle. If that's you today, 17, 18, yeah. 19, 20. Praise God if that's you. Move it to my right. Your left, if that's you, just lift your hand high. You just prayed that. You just, you just made that decision. We're just sealing it right now. Thank you, Jesus. You're going to see. I want you to do this together. You're going to see people walking around, and, and if you just raise your hand, raise it up high again, and there's just someone walking around. They're just going to give you one of these cards. It says, I've decided to follow Jesus. Just hold it up real high, and they're going to come give it to you. It's nothing weird. You're not, no one's going to come to your house or anything like that. And the resurrection. Thank you for your saving work, Lord. We are now witnesses of it. I want us to say together, I am a witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ.
sing, I've witnessed your faithfulness. I've witnessed your faithfulness. Yeah. I've seen you bring life within. So I'll pour out my praise again. You're worthy. God, you're worthy of all of this. Your promises never fail. I've got stories I live. witnesses in the room let's let's testify right now how many hands up yes we are witnesses of the resurrection and the faithfulness of our God let's applaud Jesus together yeah Woo. amen yeah well, listen there's um, so many cool things happening in the life of our church but two things I want you to know is if you're a newer believer if you just raise your hand and said yes to the Lord starting next week right away next week at the 930 service, the one that you're at right now, we will have a new believer class that starts. And it's just four weeks long, just four weeks to be able to get some of the foundations of the Lord and of the scripture. And if you're already walking with Jesus and you just need a refresher, that's a great spot for you too. It'll happen over in our office, just across the courtyard. And then beginning next week, we're gonna be gathering at different times. So we're gonna be not, we won't have an eight o'clock service, but we will have a 930 and 11.15. So if you've been a long time regular here, those are different times than you would know from our past. So we're no longer 9.11. We're now 9.30 and 11.15. So we look forward to seeing you back. If you don't have a home church, we'd love to have you here. So we have donut holes and we have cold brew. And those two things, they're good for dipping. So just do that. It sounds gross, but you should try it. Just try it. God bless you. Have a wonderful Easter. We're so glad you were here with us. Take care. Bye-bye.